namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa aparuta de sangamatassa taura ye sarvanta bhamunjantu satang So this afternoon is the opportunity to reflect on Dhamma the way it is. So when I talk about Dhamma the way it is, it's here and now, which mean it doesn't have any words. You just suddenly realize consciousness is now and the way it is is like this so this is a Sunday afternoon and uh, Adam Ramat is like this listening to me is like this so these kind of simple words are very important because they, they're very uh, useful wherever you are. When you think of meditation as something you do on retreats or a special time of the day, then you're limited always to, to a technique or the assumption that meditation is something you do at a certain time or it's a discipline. Or how, how do you... How do any of you regard the word meditation? What does it mean? And emotionally, when I say you should meditate, it's good advice. So then the word meditate has maybe has different kind of emotional impact on individuals. And of course, it's a catch-all word for any kind of mental discipline. You say meditate on the scenery or meditate on the, the, there's some kind of technique you've learned from some teacher on some retreat. And you come to Amaravati to meditate. to do something mental rather than just say, talking to your friends, looking on your iPhones and uh, because you don't meditate on your iPhones or when you're with your friends, you're engaged in conversation. But when you meditate, you, you want to be alone and silent And it's something to do rather than what you really are is always here and now. Whether you're on, talking on your, looking at your iPhone or talking to your friends or relatives, it's like this. So I was asked a question recently about obsessive thinking because this is always, uh, you know, it's important to re recognize the thinking process. It's something we can, we can, um, you know, we're very attached to, we're conditioned, highly motivated and conditioned, educated to think. This is a modern 
Western society is a very thinking society. It likes to solve problems, solutions to problems, answers to questions, think about how things should be or how someone else should be or how oneself should be. So we can, we have a whole vocabulary of extreme words in any language that that convey the sense of right and wrong, good and bad, true and false. But that's not about here and now. Is this moment here right or is it wrong? You know, can you describe it in terms of good or bad? But it is like this. And then it's a kind of listening, a kind of letting go of everything and just listening. Opening up wide to just being here and now is like this. Where the thinking process can take you, you can be in Amravati and then the next moment be in Thailand or or somewhere else at home, uh, how your mind can travel all over the place, one becomes obsessed. When especially meditators who want silence, who demand that everything be still so they can meditate. And this idea that things have to be silent for me when I meditate, is like this. It's a thought, a concept about you as a separate kind of permanent individual, separate from everyone else in an environment that you want to have silence rather than noise. So meditation on that, and when we want the whole universe to shut up so we can get our samadhi, and so forth, then uh, that's the ultimate selfishness sense of I want something that I, uh, that I can't have. And desire is, you know, the, the, the drip, drip, drip of a faucet, a leaky water faucet can can drive one practically insane if you're trying to sleep because you're anticipating and I've gone through this myself where you, you hear this this drip and then you think I hope it stops and then then you wait and you're in this state of, of anticipating waiting for the next trip and then it drips and then you've have to anticipate the next one. You become totally obsessed with something as harmless as a leaky water faucet. And why do we do this? Because we think and we the desire to get rid of what we don't want and don't like and to get hold of permanently to what we think is right and true and beautiful. So the desire, that's why I keep reminding you all that this is a desire realm we're experiencing. One's human form, male and female, is a desire form in a world with objects to the senses. The senses are seeing eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, the brain are, are sensory organs in a world with objects. So what we see, like this moment, looking out at this temple here is like this. And the mind, my mind doesn't say anything when it's just noticing the way it is, it's like this. 
But when I start evaluating the present moment, well, there's a lot of people here today, or what if there was just two people, you know, then, then my mind would notice that there's only two people. What's wrong? Where's the Sangha? Or why didn't anybody come? Or that? Because the mind becomes obsessed with uh, the idea of speaking to a temple full, filled with eager, enthusiastic listeners, meditators, and Buddhists. So one time, and when I was a, I think I had about two or three pansas in Thailand with Dung Po Cha. I, uh, on the, after the, during the Katina season, and as Wat Pa Pong developed more and more branch monasteries, you know, I was invited to these katinas, and I was expected to go. And they would ask me to give a Dharma talk. And of course, I was learning Thai language. I wasn't that fluent or clever in it and to give a Dharma talk. They wanted me to, one, one evening, Numpa Cha asked me to give a Dharma talk for three hours with limited Thai language skills. So I sat up on the high seat in the Sala, a branch monastery, and I sat there and said the same thing over and over again for three hours. <laughs> And at first the sala was filled, and by the end of three hours, there were a couple of old village ladies. <laughs> and, and I had to. <laughs> and of course, when pa, Cha's aim was not that I should give a scintillating, inspiring talk or teaching Buddhism and Dhamma to people, but just to witness how I feel the kind of emotions I have when I'm the center of attention and the kind of conditioning of the mind who want to, you know, when you're sitting on a, on a high seat in a Thai sala, then you feel you've got to, you know, say things that amuse people or clever dhamma uh, talks or, or you know, a s sense of having to entertain or say important things. And uh, I began to witness this, this kind of feeling angry with Lung Po Cha for putting me in this position. Strangely enough, I was quite determined to, to do it. And... Uh, because I got the general impact that I wasn't there to, to really teach and convert everybody to Buddhism and Dhamma and say profound things or be witty and entertaining, but I was in a central position, a foreigner, in a rural Thai monastery, and this is what it's like. It's like this. And of course, the I had been a school teacher in lay life, so I had, you know, I had this school teacher mindset of having to teach, and uh, Dhamma is very important to teach, and then didn't feel like it was that clear or spoke Thai in the, in, with the right tones. I was afraid of saying something ridiculous because Thai is a tonal language, and, um, you can, uh, you know, and English is not tonal. So, so learning to listen to tones and afraid you the wrong tone or the wrong meaning would make people upset or angry or and worrying about what people were thinking. Just being the witness to the, what was going on in my mind from my conditioning.
So I lasted three hours, and uh, I've never forgotten that. <laughs> because I saw all kinds of mental states arise and cease, and and uh, and me being the witness to the way it is, feeling annoyed with Ajahn Chah like this, watching people leave the sala when you're saying something profound and important is like this, feeling of, I've said enough, or I'm not very good with the language is like this. So everything is like this. Notice it's non-critical, it's not saying, about right or wrong, good or bad, it is the way it is, it's like this. Listening to oneself. And, uh, you know, the second noble truth about desire, dhanha, this is why it's important to reflect. Dhanha is, is what we identify with, what we cling to. This is a desire realm, and we're highly motivated and programmed to cling to desires, to want to get something we don't have or get rid of something we have that we don't like. Sensual desire, wanting the pleasures of the senses. Bhava Dhanha, wanting to get samadhi, get enlightened, become a stream enterer or, a, or an arahant. Wanting to become something that we feel we're not, we're not at the present moment. Wanting silence. When it's when there's noise, it's like this. Wanting to be appreciated and understood is like this. Fear of what people will think is like this. And so forth. So just using the flow of life is what I call meditation. So it's a, it's not just a, in the in the temple at Amravati or on a ten day retreat or some special situation in a shrine room in your house. But it's life itself. Now, self-consciousness is, you know, finding myself in a position of being at abbot, uh, what head of a monastery, being called ajahn, being teacher, and all these terms put you in a, you know, how do these words affect you? Rather than trying to always be the teacher or identifying with the, with the positions that you're given or you, you acquire in your life, you can use them. And so in adjusting to a Thai culture, was quite interesting because Northeastern Thai culture is uh, when I was living in Ubon with Lung Po Cha and Wat Pa Pong, Ubon was still very kind of backward part of Thailand. It didn't have very good roads. And uh, I was the first uh, Western person to, to uh, they saw as a, as a Buddhist monk. So then there was a lot, became a focus of interest. 
And I joined the Sangha. Actually, the whole, my character is wanting to hide away. Like I thought becoming a Buddhist monk living in the forest in Thailand would be kind of like I'd be away from everything, out of the focus of every, anyone's attention. But then I became the, in the center of people's attention. So then the meditation is, you know, the, the character tendency is to live, to hide away, go in a cave, become invisible to society, and then to find myself in this position right now. And, next, and in May they're planning a birthday, a 90th birthday celebration where many people will come from Thailand, from other places. And I'm the focus, the center of it all. And it's like this. And the character tendency arises in terms of wanting to hide away, become invisible. But the power of the Dhamma, the, the meditation of being, letting go of what my character tendency happens to be. Because my character tendency is, is, uh, is rather shy. And I remember in university, when I was a university student, I, I was standing on the, the main street near the University of Washington in Seattle and wishing I could just disappear. When I was uh, the, the Jawad head monk here at Amravati and things became difficult, crises in the Sangha, I stood out in the field wishing a flying saucer would come and kidnap me. <laughs> just disappear out of sight. And because being the f center of attention, you get both the praise and blame. And so, I, and living with Lung Po Tra in Thailand, you know, I admired him. I, I saw him, uh, I kind of elevated him to being a fully enlightened master who everybody loved, but he had had to deal with conflicts and jealousies and and blame, just like all of us, just like Ajahn Amro, just like all the head monks of monasteries. It's just part of the 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 situation you're in. You're the focus, and people sometimes love you and sometimes hate you. The characters I want everybody to love me. But then not everybody loves me. So <laughs> that's the way it is. Not being appreciated or loved is like this. And just by that kind of reflection, you, you begin to realize Dhamma that is the deathless reality. Because uh, ignorance is we're always aligning ourselves with death. Whether we know what we're doing or not, just aligning ourselves with the body, with our thoughts, our, our character tendencies, our memories, our attachment to other people, to our desires, uh, sensual desires, desires for getting something we don't have and desire to get rid of what we don't like. So with a sense of thinking, we don't like it. I don't like it. But my mind does that sometimes because it's conditioned to do that. 
when there's problems or difficult situations or that then the mind creates an obsessive relationship with that particular feeling. And the more you don't want it and try to get silent and peaceful, the more obsessed you become with it. So like resistance to life is under this category of whippawadana, desire to get rid of what we don't like. And so in my meditation over the years, I realized there was a, I suffered a lot from whippawadana, desire to get rid of things. And uh, I, I really took a great interest because it was a whole new idea that I'd never thought of before. I'd always thought of desire. In English, the word desire usually means sexual desire or sensual desire. So if you say that someone's full of desires, it usually means they're, they're for sensual pleasures of some sort. But then I noticed that I held out of bhavadana, wanting to get something I didn't have. First years of my monastic life, I struggled to get samadhi and really felt angry and annoyed with things that would disrupt my peace, my tranquility. And I began to think, well, you're, you're really selfish. You want the world to be silent for so you can get something you don't have that you want that sounds really good. Like in Thailand, they talk about getting samadhi all the time. So it sounds like a goal that, you know, you should dedicate your life to samadhi and jhana, absorption, meditation. So not that that's wrong, but in terms of bhavadana, my character would grasp these concepts which I read in, in Buddhist scriptures and from teachers, and then I'd try to get the... But the character was also <clears throat> very skeptical by nature. So I was never sure or confident when I did get samadhi. Then I'd think, am I a sotapanna? Or is this jhana? Or, you know, the, the intellect would interrupt and suddenly the, the tranquility would be gone. And I'd feel frustrated again. So in why I emphasize the, the, what we call the direct approach, the Four Noble Truths, <clears throat> it's not about acquiring something you don't have or something you've heard about that sounds good, but beginning to awaken to the way it is in the present moment. So the first noble truth <clears throat> is a very wise noble truth because suffering is like this. And I began to, to have insight into understanding, wanting the, the, the three kinds of desire. So it's uh, when the Buddha, after his enlightenment, went to meet his five colleagues in, in Sarnath and, uh, and taught there's suffering, cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way of non-suffering, Four Noble Truths. Now, I used to question, why would the Buddha, enlightened master, talk about suffering to 
his five friends who'd all developed samadhi, jhanas, absorptions, according to the scriptural texts, why would he teach their suffering and the causes of suffering? So this is a very direct approach because suffering is something we all experience. Our lives as human beings are about suffering. But when we see it personally, when we see that I suffer but you don't, then, then suffering becomes something we want to get rid of rather than understand. Why do I suffer and you, you always look so happy and you're positive and everybody likes you and, and you're successful? Why, why am I not appreciated and, and uh, I suffer because, and then you think you blame your parents or your early life or traumas from, from childhood and on and on like that too, you, you still form a sense of a separate self being attached to memories of trauma as a child or misfortunes or different character, not having the same outgoing, ebullient character that someone else has. So uh, my character, as I said before, tends to be hermetic, wanting to live in a cave, hide away from life. I didn't choose that character tendency. It's not something I would have chosen if I had a choice in the matter. It's just something uh, I'm born with, it's DNA or, or whatever, because it, Blame it on my parents or on my, I, I was never abused as a child, so I can't say it's because of early childhood abuse, but, but it's, it's, it's the karmic inheritance of this form, and it's like this. And then the irony of it thrusts me into a position of being a prominent figure. So this is, uh, and it's like this, the practice is always the same. Whether the character tendency arises is like this, it comes and goes, it's not like a constant, permanent obsession, but it still arises because it's part of my karmic inheritance, and it's like this. Then the, the actual uh, conditions of the present moment are like this, so it's always like this. And when you see yourself in terms of separate form and as a separate personality identified with the body, identified with your memories, your past, your, your uh, feelings, your emotions. They're all, you know, in terms of Dhamma, just empty phenomena. And that's important reflection that the life that we take so seriously and suffer from is empty. It's imperfect, its very nature is empty. And, uh, and that means it, it doesn't have any, there's no real core or heart to it. It arises and ceases according to conditions. So, living here at Amravati as, a, as the abbot for so many years, you know, I, giving retreats, I remember in the retreat center, people would say, 
we're a 10-day retreat. We don't want that man that cuts, mows the lawn, cuts the grass, to come by the retreat hall when we're meditating. So I used to get requests for, for uh, tell the gardener to keep away when we're meditating during this 10-day retreat. And so, out of some perverse tendency I have, I would invite the lawnmower in. <laughs> Just to see if the, the, it's like the lawnmower, the sound of the lawnmower, is a, it's a mechanical sound. It's not like the wind or the rain falling on a roof or anything like that. So one can be annoyed with it. One can be obsessed. One can get an, angry because it's disturbing me. And so this, this uh, reflective style, it's like this. When I feel disturbed and, and want to, uh, want, don't want what's happening, it's like this. All of it is part of bhavana, of seeing that what arises ceases and is not self, is anatta. So, the obsessive thinking mind, uh, we have ideals, you know, so we, we become, we know how things should be. We all know how a perfect monastery should be. And uh, when, when I first went to establish Wat Banana Chat before coming to England, I had an idea of what I wanted for Wat Banana Chat. I wanted to add this. My ideal was formed the first few years at Wat Bapong with Long Pa Cha, when before it became a famous monastery. When it just had primitive kutis and well water and it was a ba kind of very basic kind of life, and I kind of formed my ideal monastery on that on that principle, and trying to keep Wat Banana Chat on a level of bamboo huts and grass roofs and and salads with. Uh, grass roofs and dirt floors was impossible because people didn't want that. And the ideal was finally I had to give in to, to uh, pressures from just the society and around me to, to give up the ideal which was, was very impractical really anyway, just based on, on a kind of idealistic tendency to, to uh, I had about a perfect monastery. Wanting serious meditators, monks who really are serious about meditating, and uh, loyal and respectful, and uh, all that was an ideal. But being Jawad, or head monk of a monastery or an abbot, was like this. You get criticized, you get blamed, you get praised, you get adored, you get your picture taken all the time. And I used to really dislike having my picture taken. I used to make a scene about it, about refusing to have my picture taken. And I upset so many people, made such a problem about it that I gave in. I said, without my paparazzi, I'm nothing. <laughs> Where's my camera crew? <laughs> I made a joke of it.
So having a sense of humor is very important. It's about yourself. Can you laugh at yourself and your own foibles and obsessions? People that can't do that are become obsessed with, you know, just uh, trying to protect themselves. Because we are ridiculous as, as individual people. When I look at my personality and its, and its obsessions and tendencies, you know, it, it's, it, some of it is very noble, I have a very noble streak, and basically I'm very virtuous, and, and I prefer that. I'm, I, like, uh, I like the Vinaya, I like the, the, the tradition very much. But also, there's rebelliousness or criticism. that go on in my mind and I can, and I, you know, you see the conflicts that, that an individual has when they take their emotions seriously and personally. Because life is like this, it's about living within a sensitive form for a lifetime. It's about suffering, experiencing praise and blame, success and failure, good fortune, bad fortune, sickness and health. And this, when, we, when people blame God for this, they said, why did God create such a realm as this where we have to suffer. If God is really compassionate, because as Christians we were brought up to believe God was very compassionate and loving, and why did he create suffering then? Why would a loving, if I was God, I wouldn't create suffering. If I was God, I'd, may, I'd want you to be happy all the time and everything would have spring, springtime, four seasons of the year, and all. If I was God, I'd make everything what I like, and, I, and because I'm basically a kind person, I'd, I'd be kind to everybody. But um, I'm not God, and the character that I live with the conditioning that I witness in daily life is like this. And I can laugh at it because it is ridiculous when we take ourselves seriously and can't laugh at ourselves, then we become ridiculous. So witnessing, as I've emphasized so many times, is not critical, like Dhamma, here and now, apparent here and now, timeless, is silent and perfect. Then the forms are not silent and perfect. The body's not silent and perfect. The, the emotional habits aren't silent and perfect. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body itself, the brain is not perfect. It's about right and wrong, good and bad, birth and death, beginning and endings. And then the witnessing of this in terms of the Four Noble Truths, letting go of desire doesn't mean we, we don't have desires. We don't get rid of desires. But we understand desires in their subtle and coarse forms. And this understanding is what we, when uh, we talk about stream entry or sodapanna, it's when we realize this for ourselves, this, 
this, this silence behind the noise of our thoughts and the habits, conditioning that, that we live with as, uh, as these desire forms, these human bodies, is not criticizing them. It's not the silence doesn't say human bodies are good or bad. They're like this. They suffer. And that suffering is to be understood, not to intellectually understand it, trying to figure out why I suffer, but suffering is like this, is actually letting go of suffering. And letting go of suffering doesn't mean suffering is, is you get rid of it, but you understand it and see that it is impermanent. It has causes and depends on conditions. They have favorable or unfavorable conditions. So with obsessive thinking, is like this. Wanting to get rid of the irritations, the obsessive thoughts, and, and that is, is like this. So you're suddenly witnessing the whippawadana, a desire to get rid of something, and get something you don't have is like this. So that whatever state you're in, no matter whether you're male or female, or monk or nun or lay person, then it's always the way it is for all of us. It can only be like this. And when life is pleasant, it's like this. It's certainly enjoyable. It's not that we shouldn't enjoy it, but we don't grasp, we don't need to grasp pleasure and idealize pleasure and beauty and happiness and goodness and virtue, idolizing it. And then, because when we do that, then we, we're very attached to ideals which are impermanent and the cause of suffering. So the growing old is like this. And so, and the living at Amravati is like this. The monks and the nuns, the lay people are like this. And this way, it's embracing life rather than wanting to sort it out or make it right or improve on it or get rid of this or get something we don't have. So this kind of reflection, I found, uh, you know, really able, a, enabling me to bear with life as I experience it. Whatever happens. So at the end of my life, You know, the, the, the body getting old and then being a kind of retired bhikkhu, being well known. And I've been given very high titles by the King of Thailand, so I've got all these really high minded titles. And so, you know, it's how this affects, it's like this. It's, it doesn't matter what they call you if you didn't have any title, because, you know, you're not interested in titles or positions or trying to become anything, but just 
being the witness to suffering, its causes, and the absence of it. So the silence behind the noise is the refuge. And when we take refuge in Dhamma, it's the refuge here and now, apparent here and now, timeless. It's not about time. These are all time-bound conditions. What manifests in consciousness is all about time. Bodies are about time. Rocks and mountains, oceans, and all that is about time. Sun, moon, and stars is all about time. Climate is about time. Time is, is, uh, is the forms that manifest in space, in consciousness. Without space, there, there could be no forms. And yet space is, is, uh, is taken for granted. But without consciousness, there wouldn't be anything. There'd be no witnessing of anything. So is consciousness personal? Is it my consciousness? And your consciousness is separate? Do Siladars have a Siladara consciousness that monks don't have? Do women have a female consciousness and men a male consciousness? You know, we can go on endlessly about dividing things up into categories, opposites, and seeing that, you know, what it's like to be a man or a woman, what it's like to be a monk or a nun is, is uh, you know, we, we might have ideals about it, but only you, you can witness what you actually feel about these, these concepts, these conditions that manifest in consciousness arise and cease, are empty phenomena. So it's a kind of liberation to realize, I'm just an empty phenomenon. This is, I'm not this form. This form is, is, is a very impermanent, changing, and, and subject to conditions that are beyond my control as a person. But what is, isn't beyond control is the witnessing. This is a refuge in the deathless Dhamma, Amata Dhamma, that the Buddha constantly points to in his teachings. So I offer this as a reflection for today.